Dr. Ashwag, who will be taking over after my introduction. There will be case presentation, and then uh, Dr. Badr Mutairi will be discussing the radiological findings. Uh, then uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Fahad bin Shamsa will be uh, will do a presentation about management update on HCC, and then there will be open discussion uh, for uh, for all. And please, if you have any question, please post your question as it comes to mind, and then Dr. Ashwag and the panelists will be uh, happy to address your questions. Um, and by this, I would like, uh, before I turn the mic uh, to Dr. Ashwag, to thank uh, uh, Lily for their support of uh, bringing this uh, webinar uh, to live. Thank you, Lily, for all their support. Dr. Ashwag, this, the mic is yours. Thank you very much for all your support and help. Assalamu uh, alaikum. Good evening, everyone. Um, can we stop sharing, Dr. Jazia, so I can share the screen? Um, all right. So today we'll be talking about a challenge case about HCC, which is um, um, unusual case. Um, everybody who's treating HCC, they know that HCC, it's all about unusual presentation and sick uh, patient and sick liver. And now with all the drug option available and lack of sequence of therapy, because we only know how to sequence both sorafenib, um, I think the floor is open. Um, I'm not encouraging people to do as we did in this case, but this case is, is very unusual. I think there is a lot of learning point from uh, this case. So I'll start, uh, it will be me and Dr. Bader. Dr. Bader will go over the radiological uh, um, uh, presentation and I'll talk about the clinical scenario. So this is a very young, um, young for us, 56 year old, uh, came to my clinic in October, 2019 as a new cases of HCC, who is not fit for local regional therapy and also not fit for transplant. Known to have IVC thrombus, port of thrombosis. He's in anticoagulation and followed by hematology. Um, his multiple thrombosis never been addressed before coming to our clinic. He was in a usual follow up with hematology because hepatitis uh, P and he's on treatment. His performance is zero. He had no symptoms. He came to my clinic walking very fat. All of LFT was normal except glucogen of 91. If I have this um, consultation come to, to me on the desk without seeing the patient, I will totally reject this patient and send him back as he's not fit for systemic therapy because we know that the medication, we might drag the patient into liver failure faster than the cirrhosis and the HCC itself. So again, back to the case, he had a normal LFT, bilirubin was very high, alpha fetal protein was 2,789. We did an ultrasound looking for an obstruction. There is no obstruction by ultrasound or CT scan. That was the, the, the first aim. Um, maybe we can stent him as he's very fit. So uh, we did his first CT in October and I'll give the mic to Dr. Bader to discuss uh, um, our findings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. First, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Jazia, Dr. Ashwaf and the organizing committee um, um, we have this patient who started uh, the first images that we have in our system was in October 14, 2019. And as you can see in the images that the patient is having uh, an abnormal contour of the liver, which uh, also other signs of uh, liver cirrhosis. We can see also splenomegaly and extensive portosystemic collateral. And there is a large mass on the right hepatic lobe. The second image will uh, will demonstrate, can I go, yes. So the image on the left side, you can see that uh, it is without contrast, as you can see the abdominal aorta is not lighting up, while the one on the right side is after uh, contrast, which is in the arterial phase. And obviously it demonstrates that this mass, uh, the huge mass on the right hepatic lobe is uh, actually enhancing and there is an increased vascularity. If you move to the second uh, slide, so this is in the venous and on the delayed images, which demonstrate uh, uh, clearly that the, uh, the, uh, this mass is washing out um, uh, significantly more on the delayed. We have also another lesion up to in the, in the left hepatic lobe. Um, yes, this one, similar appearance, similar behavior. If we go to the third uh, slide, uh, Dr. Ashwa. Now clearly you can see on the left hand side the, the, uh, the arterial phase, which is showing hypervascular mass and on the right side is the delayed images. 
So we have the pillars of diagnosing um, uh, SCC by imaging, which is we have the cirrhotic liver, we have a mass that is enhancing significantly on the arterial phase and washes out in the porta venous and delayed phase. So this is uh, based on the uh, Lyrides criteria and uh, this is a hepatocellular carcinoma. So this is the initial uh, study and uh, we will go through the uh, uh, follow-up study with Dr. Rashbaugh. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Badek. So normal situation, as I've told you, when I see these patients, I send them back to hepatology as they are not fit because bilirubin is a poor indicator for the outcome and these patients will go to failure very fast. When I saw he's very young and he's dying to receive any treatment, I was thinking of, okay, let's give him uh, your um, also and try to give him two weeks and see if the bilirubin will drop. So we give him also for two weeks and he came back with bilirubin of 72, still considered very high. So what to do, I was thinking what medication can be given to the patient without impacting the LFT. Giving the fact that we know the patient have multiple thrombosis and she's in anticoagulation, the only treatment option that not gonna affect the liver function was ramirosumab at that time. And it was approved, FDA approved, she will start on eight milligram every two weeks. We started him on November. Um, after four cycle, amazing uh, that his alpha fetoprotein dropped from 2,789 to 600. So it shows us that the patient had biomark, uh, bi biochemically a good response. And we're going to go to the CT that done in January, post four cycle, and Dr. Bader will go through that. Okay, so in this case, on the left side is the one. Uh, the baseline study, which was done in October, and the one on the right side is the uh, January study, which obviously demonstrates a significant central necrosis of the tumor with uh, uh, some residual enhancing nodule. But you can see the central necrosis, which is an indication of uh, a partial response uh, to treatment. Thank you, Madam. Hey, so, again, we continue our Gamerson app. Um, the last treatment was in Feb, and we know the alpha fetoprotein was reaching 600, and uh, in February was increasing again to 1400. So we thought, okay, this is a time to do another scan. Maybe the patient has stopped responding. So we did the scan in, in uh, Feb, and this is the scan. Better? Okay, so um, you can see the uh, prior image on the right side, which is uh, January, and the uh, the uh, recent study is on uh, end of February on the left side and exactly matching the clinical uh, scenario, the clinical and the bi biochemical scenario, you can see that on the left side, there is more enhancing component and uh, the, the necrosis is still the same, which is related to prior response, but the enhancing nodule is increasing. So this is in keeping with the uh, um, uh, progression or pseudo progression that we will uh, confirm on uh, uh, follow-up study. Okay, uh, based on that and based on the ritology, we thought um, map at this time is not the best option. Given the fact that the patient, we know that his, this lesion causing the high bilirubin because the bilirubin dropped to 56 and this is the best number he ever had. He was fluctuating between 90s and 70, but 56 was the best that we got. So we thought second line, Nivolumab will be a, a, bit op a better option. Uh, we were in the COVID crisis. We start him the nivolumab, the higher dose every uh, four weeks. And after three cycle in June, we repeat his uh, CT scan. And this is the scan. Okay, so, um, so we're comparing the one in uh, uh, February, in the February on the left side, and the one in the June, mid June on the right side. And as you can see that uh, the, the enhancing nodule is slightly bigger, which is also an indication of um, progression of, of the disease. Not significantly, but it is progressing. Uh, also, the smaller nodule are becoming more enhancing on the, on the June study, which is in the left hepatic lobe. Thank you. So, yes. Question. <laughs> okay. So based on the new data, we know in March, we have the approval of, um, of uh, the Atizuavastor and the Embraer clinical trial. And I think a lot of people would argue with me, patient field immunotherapy. 
or do you think of giving another immunotherapy? We know a patient had a good response to anti-VGF. So if we have these combination, he might have a good response and still he is Take eye will be very toxic and very slow response. So we start with a Tizu and a Vastin. Usually I start the Vastin 10 milligram by kg. I don't start the 15. And the patient doesn't have varices. He was cold. We know he had multiple thrombosis. Again, anti-VGF. It's slightly, we can say it's not an absolute contraindication, but will be risky at that time. So we were watching the patient very closely. So alpha to protein drop, um, um, it reached on nivolumab uh, to 2,666. And after one cycle of atezoavastin, it's dropped to 756 after one cycle. Patients start after cycle two to show increase in his LFT and ASCLT. It was a mild increase on the um, uh, alpha to protein uh, to increase also in uh, the bilirubin. Uh, it was not to the stage to start steroid, but we thought, let's do a CT scan now, and um, we'll, we'll see what, what happened. So his next CT scan was um, last week, and Badr was uh, he, kindly to review all the scan. So Badr, talk us about the scan. Okay, so uh, on the left side, we have uh, the one done in mid-June, and on the right side, we have the one done recently in August. And obviously, you can see the amount of central necrosis has significantly uh, increased, and there is a significant central necrosis. Also, the enhancing nodule has uh, reduced also significantly more than 60-70 percent. Uh, similar changes happening to the smaller lesion in the left hepatic lobe. So this is uh, an indication of a great response uh, to the treatment. Thank you. So uh, this is the end of the case. Uh, the patient, we, he's off therapy now. Um, we stopped the treatment. And our plan um, uh, that the patient will, um, um, the patient will, uh, will, will, will wait and um, um, uh, review every week. And if there is any increase in his LFT, the plan is to maybe start him on treatment, active treatment to immune induce uh, hepatitis. For the time being, he doesn't meet the criteria. So he is off therapy, but it's an unusual case and unusual sequence um, 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 for, for this patient. Um, so this is the end of the case and we're ready to have any question, but we'll ask Dr. Fahad uh, to give us the review. Maybe the, um, the, the discussion and question will be at the end uh, of, uh, of, of the session. All right, Fahad? Thank you very much, Ashwag and Dr. Jazia, for the uh, invitation uh, to participate with you in this uh, very interesting uh, uh, program. Um, excellent. Do you see my screen? Yeah, and I would like to thank uh, the team uh, behind this. I would like to thank Mohammed, Jason, Mary, and uh, Hanan for the very elegant uh, communication. So my task today is to review with you the uh, updates about the uh, systemic treatment for hepatocellular uh, carcinoma after the very interesting case that we, uh, we had uh, with Dr. Ashwag and Dr. Badr. So as you know, liver cancer ranks uh, sixth among Saudi males and 12th among Saudi females. So it's more common uh, in males and accounts for 3% of uh, all cancers. It's the most, uh, it's more common in men, as we said, it's the most rapidly increasing uh, cancer since uh, 1980. Actually, the rate of increase is 3% each year since 2006. Risk factors uh, predominantly is cirrhosis, the main uh, risk factor and chronic infection with hepatitis B and C etiology for cirrhosis and also alcohol use underlie more than 75% of HCC cases. Obesity, metabolic syndrome also add to uh, clinical factors. Uh, those who treat uh, and see patients with HCC, uh, they know that when they see one, uh, uh, the patients, they deal with two diseases, cirrhosis and uh, liver cancer compete, uh, are, are competing uh, causes for uh, death. Cirrhosis lead to multifocal hepatocarcinogenesis and higher cancer rate from regeneration nodules. 
portal hypertension, thrombocytopenia, uh, further complicate uh, the case and treatment selection and patient eligibility for treatment, uh, as well as impaired liver function, complicated clinical trial design as a result of the complicated uh, disease. Uh, so uh, these are the BCLC staging and treatment uh, guidelines from Barcelona Clinic, we will be focusing on systemic treatment for advanced uh, stage and they cannot focus enough uh, uh, about the importance of managing these patients through a multidisciplinary approach and a tumor board with all these related uh, services that they can help uh, the patient. These are the localized treatment, but we'll focus on the treat, uh, systemic treatment. This was the first uh, trial to show an effective uh, treatment, uh, Sorafen, the landmark SHARP trial, uh, and also the Asia Pacific. Uh, they are very similar trials. The Asia Pacific included mostly Asian patients and more advanced uh, patients. Uh, and the two trials confirmed each other and they confirmed the uh, benefit of Sorafen as you can see from the uh, clearly separated couple of uh, survival curves. Um, as uh, good trials, we, we, uh, with time, we learn experience, and we have uh, uh, further trials and papers come out from this trial. And this report uh, 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 indicates that probably the survival benefit is, is greater in patients with uh, hepatitis C uh, virus uh, etiology uh, of HCC. It was another decade till we had uh, another uh, effective A agent which is lymphatinib uh, was looked at and studied in this reflect uh, study, a kind of similar study to SHARP trial, only fine differences. So lymphatinib, non-inferior design, uh, challenging uh, sorafenib, uh, and uh, the study was positive and lymphatinib was not inferior to sorafenib in survival. Actually, it was a bit uh, uh, superior in uh, progression-free survival as a secondary endpoint. And since then, we had lymvatinib as an alternative option to sorafenib in the first line setting. Uh, same class, same toxicity profile with sorafenib, only uh, a bit uh, slightly uh, more hypertension lymvatinib and more hand foot syndrome in uh, sorafenib. And uh, since the reflex study, whenever I meet a Schwab and other uh, colleague who are interested in HCC, we always discuss to try to differentiate between uh, these uh, two uh, agents uh, so to select the best for our patients. And all of the clues come from subgroup analysis. Uh, for example, sorafenib may be preferred in patients with HCV, uh, uh, as we saw in the previous paper. And maybe lymvatinib uh, is, is good when you look at uh, response rate and progression-free survival. And maybe it, uh, lymvatinib works better in patients with very aggressive disease, uh, for example, high tumor burden or high uh, alpha fetoprotein. But probably we do not need this discussion anymore because we have uh, more recently uh, this uh, uh, trial, uh, Embrave 150, which looked at a tizolizumab, bifizumab, uh, challenging sorafenib uh, in the first line of advanced HCC. This study was presented in ISMO Asia uh, last year. This is the study design, so first line uh, setting locally advanced HCC. Uh, patient will be randomized uh, two to one ratio to either a tizolizumab, pivizumab, or sorafenib. The co primary endpoints were overall survival and progression uh, free survival. Very uh, uh, well designed study, very well balanced uh, between uh, inpatient characteristics. And this is the first primary endpoint the overall uh, survival and the median overall survival for atezolizumab was not stimulable uh, at the uh, cutoff uh, data when they reported this. So often it was survival was 13.2 months. Very impressive, has the ratio 0 0.58 and significant uh, p-value. Uh, also progression-free survival was superior uh, in the uh, immune therapy uh, combination at ISO, uh, PIP. And uh, when it comes to subgroup, it seems that all subgroups benefit from this combination uh, compared to uh, sorafenib in overall survival and also in progression-free uh, survival. So the uh, objective response rate in this study for the combination was uh, 33%. Uh, also, the uh, actually the median duration of response was not stimulable again uh, uh, when they reported uh, this data. And this is the beauty for immune therapy 
Uh, yes, uh, only maybe a small proportion of patients respond, but if they respond, they do well. Uh, there was no uh, signal in the toxicity. Now we, l we learned how to deal and how, and how to read uh, toxicity profile for these uh, new therapy uh, agents. Uh, most of side effects in the combination were in single digit, relatively rare side effects with the exception of hypertension, which was at about 15%. Uh, uh, also, uh, it was nice uh, from authors to report patient reported outcomes, which tells you about the quality of life uh, benefits. So, atezolizumab uh, delayed the time of deterioration of patient reported quality of life compared to uh, sorafenib. It was 11.2 months compared to 3.6 months. Very nice to see this association for quality benefit uh, uh, with the uh, efficacy uh, uh, benefit. So since the trial uh, was published, was published more recently in New England Journal of Medicine, and it's now uh, an, uh, a preferred uh, option in the first And then uh, again, good trials, uh, you, with time, you, uh, more papers come out from this randomized population to tell you and give you more insight how to deal with this and how to read this trial. This report was uh, presented in the uh, GI uh, Cancer Symposium uh, 2020. Uh, and uh, it's about the older uh, uh, adults enrolled in the Embraer 150. And it showed, uh, reassured, uh, reassured us that uh, older population, they also drive uh, a similar benefit as younger population. Older population here defined as uh, 65 years uh, or more, as you can see from the survival curves, uh, uh, clear separation of the curves. Uh, also, patient reported outcomes for the older population was uh, very comparable to uh, younger population. That was very assured. So what about second line uh, agents uh, after we use uh, either like sorafenib, vivatinib or the newer preferred regimen, uh, atezolizumab, tetezumab, uh, second line. Many uh, agents studied, uh, but at this point we have rivorafenib, nivolumab, capuzantinib, ramisorumab, pimpurizumab uh, as options. Probably pimpurizumab, the phase three trial was negative, but it's still uh, FDA uh, approved. So I, I uh, classified the second line agents as uh, in TKI, eyes, VGF monoclonal antibodies, and immune therapy checkpoint uh, inhibitors. I'll start with the TKI eyes. And first one uh, was regorafenib, which, which is an oral multikinase inhibitor targeting multiple uh, tumor pathways, very similar chemically in, in a chemical structure, very similar to sorafenib, only differences in the uh, fluorine carbon uh, atom. Uh, it was uh, this uh, resource study published in Lancet Oncology 2017. This is the trial design. So uh, in this study, they randomized uh, patients who uh, tolerated uh, sorafenib and then progressed on sorafenib to, uh, in a, again, in a two-to-one ratio, it seems this is uh, consistent in HCC trials to regorafenib or uh, placebo. And this is the primary endpoint, graph improved survival to 10.6 months compared to 7.8 uh, months. Uh, again, to remind you, the resource uh, trial enrolled only those patients to discontinue sorafenib because of uh, progressive disease. They excluded patients who were intolerant uh, of sorafenib. So in this study, uh, uh, half of the population, uh, of the study population required uh, dose reduction. But to tell you uh, the real uh, uh, practice, uh, more than that, almost all patients, they require uh, dose reduction for uh, regular. Uh, this paper published in Journal of Hepatology showed the cumulative survival of sorafenib and regorafenib of 26 uh, months, which was impressive. Uh, but uh, uh, I remind you, this is a cumulative survival of sorafenib, then regorafenib. The second option is capozantinib, which was looked at in the celestial uh, study published in New England Journal uh, of Medicine. Again, uh, post uh, sorafenib, second line, two to one ratio again, capozantinib uh, uh, compared to uh, placebo. Uh, quite large study, uh, uh, relatively when it comes to HCC study, 760 patients enrolled in this uh, study. Um, 
you will see uh, cabozantinib uh, appearing in the second line and also in the third line options in the guidelines because in this celestial study, uh, more than a quarter of patients received two prior regimens before a cabozantinib or placebo. This is the primary endpoint that cabozantinib approved a survival to 10.2 months compared to eight months in a placebo uh, hazard ratio 0 0.76, clear separation of uh, survival curves. Second option is vascular anterior growth factor receptor monoclonal antibodies. And the only option here is ramisolumab, uh, which was uh, looked at uh, in two uh, REACH study, REACH 1 and REACH 2. So REACH 1 study assessed second line ramisolumab advanced HCC, but that study failed to meet primary point to prolong overall survival in the intention to treat population because, uh, so, but uh, despite that, there was a signal of survival benefit seen in a subgroup of elevated uh, baseline uh, alpha V214. And we know elevated alpha V214 level is a poor prognostic indicator. This is the REACH1 study you can see in the upper part, the high alpha V214 defined here as 400 nanogram per milliliter or more and part of the uh, diagram showing the uh, low alpha to protein, you see there was no benefit uh, of ramsorbab in this uh, population. Uh, so the, that led to a design of REACH2 study, and this time this study is enriched with, uh, actually uh, it was eligibility criteria and inclusion criteria that they should have high alpha to protein, 400 or more patients were randomized to ramisonab or placebo. Primary endpoint was overall uh, survival. Again, post sorafenib, and this is the uh, survival curve, uh, or clear separation, there was some approved survival, uh, p-value was significant, and the survival at uh, 18 months was more than double, 24.5 months uh, percent, uh, oh, sorry, uh, percent compared to 11.3% uh, percent at 18 months. Uh, um, yeah. So when it comes to uh, uh, adverse event of special interest regarding ramisorumab, uh, those uh, who use ramisorumab, they know it's very tolerable uh, drug, as we saw actually from the uh, patient of Dr. Ashwag, uh, uh, very well tolerable. Uh, hardly you see any side effects. You need to watch for blood pressure, uh, actually, uh, very rarely you see epistaxis, proteinuria, or impaired uh, liver function. Uh, REACH2 study uh, was uh, the first positive phase three trial for a biomarker selective HCC population. We had no biomarker before this study. And this is the first positive phase three trial for VGF targeted monoclonal antibody in HCC. So ramisorumab after the study is a potential alternative second line treatment, but only for the uh, selected population of high alpha V214. How to select second line agent then? We had, uh, now we have the luxury of having all of these agents uh, on the table uh, and to choose from uh, for our patients. Uh, uh, look at the uh, regorafenib, regorafenib is used post sorafenib. Uh, but they had to tolerate sorafenib. Uh, cabozantinib can be used also in the third line beside the second line, no matter if they tolerate sorafenib or not. Ramisorumab also, if they progressed or uh, uh, intoler intolerance to sorafenib, but they had to have uh, alpha to protein. You can see this uh, uh, graph showing the magnitude of benefit uh, uh, for uh, these agents and probably. Uh, um, almost equal uh, in each case, but for high alpha to protein, I, it, it, to me, if I have a patient like that, like a uh, Shua patient, uh, it attracts me towards Ramisormab in the second line sitting there. Uh, when you look at hazard ratio of the survival, it was 0 0.63 or Dorafenib, Kavzantinib 0.76, 0 0.71 for Ramisormab. What about toxicity? seems the most tolerable uh, agent is ramisorumab, uh, which we know from our uh, practice. The third option is the checkpoint inhibitors, and uh, we had uh, nivolumab and fibrozumab. They were approved because of phase one, two uh, uh, study. This is just uh, a brief of 
the uh, study design and uh, outcomes. Response rate was somewhere between 14 and 17 uh, percent. Um, median of survival was 15 months for nivolumab, 13 months for pembrolizumab. They were approved in a second line uh, setting due to these phase one, two uh, study. Uh, pembrolizumab came negative in a phase three trial, so uh, to me, it's not an option anymore in a second line setting. Uh, this, this paper came out from the nivolumab uh, phase two study. And uh, again, uh, we mentioned that before, not everybody responds to immune therapy. Only maybe a quarter of patients respond to immune therapy or less. But if they respond, they do well, and that's doing well and dura uh, durable responses, durable survival, that's what brings the survival care up. As you can see on the green line, uh, these are the patients who had complete or partial response to nivolumab, they uh, actually plateau uh, after two years. Okay, what about, again, uh, toxicity profile, including uh, the uh, immune therapy? Again, you see uh, the, uh, uh, this goes in favor of uh, checkpoint inhibitors and uh, ramesuramab uh, uh, it comes to toxicity. Okay, this is probably the, the last agents, uh, our study I will talk about tonight, uh, which is uh, more, uh, very recent, was uh, presented in the last ASCO, phase two study, uh, studying uh, a combination of immune therapy, anti-CTLA-4 trimelumab combined to dobalumab and tbd one patients with advanced hepatitis or carcinoma in a second line setting. So in this uh, phase two study, uh, the, uh, it's a randomized expansion cohort uh, and they presented uh, the safety. The primary point was safety in this study, but they also reported secondary points of survival. It's, it's, it's an early phase study, so you see multiple uh, cohorts uh, of population, but we will uh, focus on the trimelumab uh, at a dose of a 300 plus dorvalumab, about 75 uh, patients. And this is the survival curves for these uh, patients. You, you may see the uh, combination of uh, anti-CTLA-4, trimelumab, and anti-BD-1, dovalumab, median survival is uh, impressive, and it's uh, reached 18.7 uh, months. Uh, this is the median overall uh, survival. Um, at uh, 12 months, 60% of patients were alive, 52% uh, at 18 uh, months. Again, as you see in, uh, in uh, immune therapy, duration of response. So if they do respond, they uh, uh, tend to have durable response. So the median duration of response was not reached when they reported the study for the, for the T300 dorvalumab. This is phase two study, and uh, we are waiting for the uh, phase three randomized Himalaya study uh, to confirm this uh, benefit of this uh, immune therapy uh, combination. So um, I'm towards my conclusion. This is the landscape at this point for the systemic treatment in the first line. We have sorafenib, nivatinib, and more preferably, in general, atezolizumab, bevacizumab uh, in the first line setting. Second line, uh, we have regorafenib, cabozantinib, ramsorumab for higher ketoprotein, and nivolumab. Third line is cabozantinib. But honestly, uh, this is, we are not strict. This is the evidence but we should not be so tight and blind with the evidence-based medicine. We, we need to look at case by case, and I think you can sequence between these agents. You can give uh, a second line of if they progress, you can give, and I do give, let's say, nivolumab or remesolumab as a third line. If I have a patient like, like Ashwag, uh, who's not uh, eligible to receive sorafenib, nivatinib, or atizubib, uh, and higher ketoprotein, Again, it's very attractive to use uh, ramosolumab. So we need to look at it case uh, by case. This is the uh, most recent uh, uh, version of the vascular carcinoma, and it lists all the uh, options that we talked uh, about. Again, uh, and over and over, these patients should be managed through a multidisciplinary uh, tumor board that includes all of these subspecialties, medical oncology, hepatology, radiology, primary care, radiation, surgery, IR, uh, uh, nursing, uh, and palliative care, and others uh, to decide and select the best treatment for uh, each single uh, patient. Thank you very much. Uh, 
thank you, Fahad. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, nice review. I uh, would ask um, the participant uh, to uh, do the evaluation before the question. It's very simple, so they can get the CME hours. I don't see any question uh, posted. Uh, there is one. My question, how to sequence the subsequent line if the patient receive a TISO, a Vastin, in the first line to switch to TKI or to use another immunotherapy? Um, they can hear us. We don't have to type it right. Um, I hope. Uh, so, fact. <laughs> <Go ahead. laughs> uh, thank you, Ashwag. This is an uh, excellent uh, question. We always think about it. And this is our, the nature of our specialty because we always have these new evidences of newer agents. We're happy to have another option. But then we remind ourselves, oh, we don't have uh, an evidence for a second line for this first line. To me, I think it's straightforward. If I, if I give a patient a tezolizumab, this is my first line, I will think of sorafenib as a second line according to the uh, clinical uh, context, of course. So let's say if the patient has a uh, very high to protein, toward If the patient is uh, limited performance, probably I will go. Uh, I will think about immune therapy again. Maybe to, to throw a TKI between. Uh, again, we look at case by case. But in general, sorafenib will be my preferred second line. Sure, um, I, I will do the same. I will do the same. So thinking of TKI, probably you have the luxurious of choose between sulafenib and lenvatinib. So it will be the option of uh, the oncologist. It's about your experience, your experience with the drug, knowing the toxicity, knowing the side effect, and knowing your patient. So I think the most important of using any medication that you know what is your limitation? Um, so for me, I will be very hesitant to start lambatinib because my experience is very low on this drug. But in Atizu, we've used this medication on another indication and we know it. Uh, Avastin, we use it in a different indication. So it make it easy uh, for us. Um, Ashwag, I have a comment till we have another question about the case, if you allow me. Yeah, please. And uh, uh, I will... Uh, uh, Thank you for your courage to start your patient despite high bilirubin. You know, uh, HCC patients, when we see them, we think HCC, but high bilirubin, we started patients before on chemotherapy actually, with high bilirubin, let's say if you have chronic cancer patients, good performance status, you think your chemo will help him if you induce some response. So we give chemotherapy with a dose a reduction. And again, we should be, uh, uh, of course, we need to follow the evidence based with about first line, second line. But again, we should look at it case by case and try to select the best for our patient. We think we should think patient, patient-centered approach. Yes. So, so uh, yeah. So, thank you. Yeah, I think we should tailor the therapy per the patient. But um, as as much as I've seen patient with HCC, um, looking at the child score, I think the worst indicator is the belly. When we start a patient with high bilirubin, we push him into failure. That's why I was very hesitant. When I was looking in, um, on how to adjust the dose of TISO on a patient with liver impairment, especially the bilirubin, it seemed there is no clear adjustment. And even a patient with dialysis, I have a patient on hemodialysis, I was thinking of starting on a TISO of Aston first line. So, <clears throat> so it's not clear. Um, but when you have the AC and ALT elevated, we know that you're starting to have drug-induced, um, uh, hepatitis-induced by immunotherapy. And this patient, in fact, has a mild cough. And uh, the ER doctor was treating him as bronchitis. So he started with steward and he responded very nicely and he did well. He did not treat him as he's a patient on immunotherapy. Um, CT scan, it seemed that early changes of immunotherapy in the lung as well. That's why it was very cautious. But uh, let's ask you, Fahad, since they have no questions. No questions. And I there have a question, question for you. Uh, There's a question from Dr. Jazzy, I think. Um, would you uh, would, HCC, yeah, go ahead. Okay, yeah. Would the cases of HCC, viral hepatitis, other dictate type of therapy? I think Fahad uh, answered this question, but it's not really clear 
which patient you treat because if you know how hepatitis is not one subtype of uh, viral hepatitis it's a different sub subtype and every region has a different um, uh, type of viral infection so it does it make any difference initially that initial thoughts and, and immunotherapy that patient on hep B and hep C they do well and honestly, from my own experience, they do well, better than hepatitis B and C. Do we know why? No. Um, I make a review for the patient. They have a complete response uh, on sorafenib. And all the patients that have complete response were hepatitis C, as you've had. Mm -hmm. And the data from the ASCO that, an abstract that patient with hepatitis B, they do better on sorafenib. So I think it's probably different from the region because I think the, vi the virus are different from each one because there's a lot of subtype and I'm discussing one of the hepatologists that we don't have the same viral, even if it's hepatitis C that affecting same, um, same um, uh, the genomic is different from, uh, from area to area. Absolutely, so, Ashwag, I, I concur with you, I agree with you. Uh, uh, actually, uh, if, uh, I remind you, we had uh, in the last ASCO the Chinese study of Dunafenib, and the most criticism of the study that it's, uh, it's included only Chinese patients. That's why it did not include in my talk. So only Chinese patients and predominantly hepatitis B. So 80%, more than 80%. And, and one of the discussants was thinking that probably if it was from uh, some analysis of the study, maybe if it was like uh, C and B and others, we don't know what, what happened to, to, to the results of the study. Uh, so I think the etiology affects the, the outcome and somehow a, a very weak evidence of a subgroup analysis can predict a better response, let's say to sorafenib, maybe levatinib and cabozantinib better with hepatitis B. Uh, as you said, conflicting papers about sorafenib B or C, but I like more the, the paper of, of, of C to see uh, uh, improved uh, efficacy. So uh, I agree with the question that it's something to think about, but the evidence is not uh, very strong. Um, there is another question, but let me ask better one question, uh, because you see more patients, especially in our, in our, in our institution, treating with immunotherapy. How challenging the radiology, because uh, you know, the suit progression and everything happening. How is the challenge and are we using, uh, other than rhesus criteria, like the immune rhesus criteria? Uh, yes, actually we had a, a weekly meeting in our uh, department and we have discussed uh, the use of uh, uh, the immune rhesus, the eye rhesus, which is uh, we are recommending our uh, colleagues to read it and they are aware about the phenomena of uh, pseudo progression and they have to, uh, we call it like IUPD, like uh, immuno-unconfirmed progression of the disease. So they have to be aware of it. Uh, we already discussed it in our department, in our body imaging group. And um, it is the, the only problem is, um, which I already uh, informed uh, our colleague in the oncology, is, is very important to indicate in the indication because you know, these names are uh, difficult sometimes for us as a radiologist. So I think I would recommend if uh, the oncologist uh, like indicate that this is immunotherapy. The names sometimes, you, you recognize the names, but the names are difficult for uh, maybe non-oncologists. Um, um, but the idea of uh, rhesus, uh, immuno, uh, immune, immune uh, rhesus criteria is, is well established and we are encouraging our colleague to use it. And probably you are seeing it in some of our reports, some are uh, discussing the pseudo progression and recommending uh, short term follow up, like yeah. four, four weeks, four to six weeks. And I see the report become more fancy, but you're right, yeah, and you become more fancy. The question from Dr. Jazia, Dr. Jazia, is there an evidence of switching between two checkpoint inhibitor will make a difference uh, whether for toxicity or efficacy? Um, I don't think in HCC we have any sequence. I'm not really sure about other solid tumor. No, we don't. Uh, if we refer to the case, it's everything is unusual in this case, either the first line, second line, and even Avastin and Atizu on the third line. That's um, why it's challenging cases, right? Well, Dr. Ashwag, if you allow me, 
Uh, well, we know we know we do not have uh, evidence for sequencing mm -hmm. immune uh, therapy just simply because the age of immune therapy is what like five years, maybe less than five years. We cannot have first line and second line. Uh, I think in all tumor sites, uh, but uh, we know immune therapies uh, are not. I'm not saying that we can sequence, but I'm thinking uh, immune therapies are not alike. That's why you see positive for one agent and negative for one agent. Right, so they're not alike. So when you have two agents effective in this treatment, uh, you do, I, I think in the future, near future, we will be sequencing and the more uh, papers uh, we get out of this randomized trial, and we, we will look to the subsequent uh, treatments, you will find, I, I think it was in the, the kidney cancer, they, was, uh, they looked at in the subsequent uh, treatment after immune therapy and immune therapy was kind of effective. Uh, somehow, but anyways, this is just follow-up observational uh, study after the undermine study. So I think in the near future we will be able to uh, sequence uh, immune therapies, and we will know better. Okay. Um, right, and I see people. I think maybe the case very unusual. There is no question. Yeah, yeah, no, no, very difficult. Well, I can't clear. But if I'm if I had if I'm gonna draw a line, whether take EI and immunotherapy in the first line. Uh, who's the patient you're going to propose immunotherapy and who's the patient you're going to propose TKIs in the first line? Thank you very much for this question. Uh, uh, so, my uh, uh, immune therapy on 350 showed clearly that it is superior and it, it, the patients will drive a better survival benefit. Uh, I will follow the trial. They excluded, let's say, patients with autoimmune disease. They excluded transplant patients, uh, and they excluded uh, uh, patients with uh, uh, variceal uh, bleeding or bleeding tendencies, uh, or contraindications to bevacizumab or atezolizumab, any contraindication. These patients, I think, uh, uh, they, they, they should, uh, uh, I will select sorafenib for them, or lembatinib, uh, of course. Uh, so, sorafenib is there and will remain on the table as option uh, for this patient. I had a patient last week, Ashwag, uh, and uh, he was ready, excellent performance status, advanced child A, and I, I offered him a tizuzumab, pivizumab, and he asked me, do you have any oral treatment? He does not want IV treatment, and he was thinking, I want to go to the south near to, to his residence, and uh, we can send him pills, and he can prescribe from local pharmacy there. Uh, there's a local oncologist to follow him. So I, I explained to him that this option is available, but we have a superior treatment. Uh, there is an increment, small increment, but it is there, uh, a benefit from the atezolizumab combination. Uh, I offered him, he was clear, he chose to go for sorafenib. So I think sorafenib remains uh, an option on the table for these patients, but in general, uh, atezolizumab is uh, superior in, in regarding efficacy. I agree. And even elderly people, they tolerate the atezolizumab even it's a combo more than sorafenib, uh, especially the people above 70. Um, so I, I don't know, it's a sleeping time. The nest, nobody is asking any question. Um, I think we address all the aspects of this case, and uh, do I do I encourage people to start? Uh, not. I will, I, can, can I ask a question, Ashwag? Yes, and it's good. about 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 the case. Okay. Sandra. How was the tolerance to first line remesorumab, and how did you deal with the pharmacy in this regard? The pharmacy. No, no, the pharmacy. but this behind the kawalis. Okay. It's nice that you can convince them about that this individual patient needs this kind of treatment at this time. I'm a very convincing person. Uh, this bit of toxicity or uh, tolerance, this is my, not my first patient on Ramrisimab. I've treated around, around eight patients. Tolerance is beautiful. I'm a big believer on this drug. It is the best drug. And even thinking maybe Ramrisimab is a very strong anti-VGF if we have it to combination to other medication, maybe a clinical trial will give the combination maybe to have a better benefit than Avastin uh, per se. So no, no toxicity, no hypertension, no proteinuria, no thromboembolic. Yeah, I, had, I had only one patient who had um, 
what looks like coronary artery disease, which was not related to the medication because he had all the risk uh, feature. I have to stop the drug, but I did not resume it again, but I sent him to cardiology for spending. Please so don't. it reflects, uh, we have uh, more experience than HCC. We have it in gastric and colorectal cancer patients, and it's very tolerable, really. And that's what's, what's, uh, what's uh, kind of attractive for me if I have an option to start Tromosolum. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the beauty now, um, we have a couple of first line and we have tons of second line and uh, probably one, um, one, uh, one, uh, one in the third line. So the sequence is still a mystery. So it's, it's in our hand to make the sequence. Fab. That will give you the luxury of using a second line or third line. There is a question, um, uh, prognosis using immunotherapy with metastatic HCC. If I had said that very clearly, that when patients respond to immunotherapy, sometimes the response will be a durable response and um, the prognosis will be better. And you have to take in consideration a lot of things. Your patient, um, the toxicity, and also the outcome. So if the patient can't tolerate the drug, no toxicity, and the outcome is good, you have it all. And if you have patients not tolerating and good outcome, you should not assume the therapy. So uh, can I have a question to... Uh, I have an elderly to, patient, extreme uh, prognosis. Okay. Prognosis using immunotherapy, which is the same. It's any treatment you apply to your HCC, if they have response, it's going to reflect on uh, the outcome. But immunotherapy, if they, if, if, did, um, um, uh, if they did well, they would have a better prognosis. Now I'm going to give you an example of a durable response of immunotherapy. Immunotherapy. Patient have bad skin toxicity. It's a grade three. So I have to stop after three cycles and six months down the road, the patient have a 60% response to the initial response on a tissue of Aston. So I think the outcome of the immunotherapy, regardless to the sub, uh, subtype of the tumor, is the best if the patient responds because you have only two either patient responds or don't respond. And that's why, Ashwag, we need to follow these patients uh, in the first few months of treatment to know if they are the, one of these responders or maybe if they don't respond, so you do a switch and be cautious about uh, CD progression. We don't see it much in HCC, Ashwag, CD progression for immune therapy, uh, uh, but uh, of course we need to look at it. I have a question for Dr. Badr, if you allow me, Ashwag. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so Dr. Bader, what is the uh, effect of uh, atypical HCC, fibrolamellar, and, 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 and the radiological diagnosis of HCC? Sometimes we discuss cases in tumor board, and they say this is atypical, and you need biopsy and things. So can you shed some light on this? Well, thanks for the question. Um, uh, recently introduced the LIRAD system, which is uh, probably you're aware of uh, that uh, is trying to minimize the uh, the variability in reporting and uh, um, discussing the finding of the HCC. What is agreed upon now when we call it LIRAD5, which is LIRAD5, which is definitive HCC, um, which is almost 95%. We are confident the HCC. Uh, as I said in the in the case, the pillars should include the cirrhotic liver. Um, you should have a truly enhancing lesion which is enhancing on the arterial face and washes out on the portal venous and the late images. This is the typical, the almost 95% uh, confidence that this is hepatocellular. Now, the range will go lower if we have atypical. Uh, fibrolamellar, as you know, is very rare and it happens in non cirrhotic liver. The LIRAID system, we use it only in cirrhotic liver or with a patient with a chronic hepatitis B virus. So uh, the uh, less finding will make us uh, less confident. And uh, if it's LIRAD4, then we have to discuss it in, in the tumor board, almost 80% uh, of the LIRAD4 are HCC. But we call it LIRAD4 uh, because we are not confident enough to call it. We are, we are not almost 95% confident to call it HCC. These cases will be discussed in the tumor board and based on these cases, we can, we can recommend either biopsy or short-term follow-up or 
uh, we might add, uh, for example, MRI, which can have some ancillary findings in the diffusion weighted images, which will in improve the confidence to call it FCC. Uh, some cases which are, we know that it's malignant, but we are not sure is it FCC. There are some types like uh, hepatocholangiocarcinoma. Uh, it's a mixed type. Uh, some cholangio, uh, it also can mimic FCC. For these cases, if we are not confident enough to call it FCC, even if it's cirrhotic liver, then we have to recommend a biopsy. Because we are allowed to make a, like a, a confident uh, uh, diagnosis in order to uh, treat the patient either with uh, local regional treatment or with systematic treatment based on imaging. Uh, and based on imaging, we have only the uh, pairs of uh, uh, lyrid floor. It has to go to the multidisciplinary team, which will uh, We'll discuss it and we'll correlate with the alpha fetoprotein with other images, and then we might accept it to be uh, treated as FCC, or sometimes we will uh, recommend a biopsy. I hope I can answer your oh, question. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Ahmed. Ahmed, very active. Shukran, Ahmed. questions. Uh, he was, he want to ask if a is not available, can he use immunotherapy in the first line, like nivolumab? Uh, evidence, well, non evidence, non evidence, you have to go so often in Bovlam that in it. What I'm going to do, I'm going to use Nivolumab first line. <laughs> and so, I'll share with you, no, no, I, I'll, you know, this is excellent, <laughs> a very smart question <laughs> because it's always a debate between us, uh, HTC oncologists. Mm -hmm. So the Chickmate 459. Uh, phase three study, nivolumab versus sorafenib in uh, first line. The study's design was superiority design, and nivolumab was not superior. So, so the rate was, was negative better. study. But the response rate was better for the uh, nivo. Uh, survival was the same. You know, survival was uh, uh, similar. So, uh, and it was more tolerant. Patients were more tolerant to nivolumab. Okay. Study negative, so it cannot make it to the guidelines, right? But when you look at the population, so uh, benefit is almost the same. Uh, tolerance favors nivolumab, response rate favors nivolumab. And that's why Ashwag says I'll start the deal practice <laughs> nivolumab. To me, I, I will start, so, I'll start so often, but you know what? I wish, <laughs> I, I'm hesitant. Maybe I'll start nivolumab, I don't know. I, you know what? I'll use the performance status. If they sometimes, if they are like performance two, probably so often if not the best, I will go straight to nivolumab. And from my own experience, with nivolumab, the patient tolerate and do better, way better oh. than sorafenib. But there is a subgroup they do excellent on sorafenib. Till the, the time that we have the knowledge which patient, which which. I think it's, uh, we should go by the guideline. You should go by the guideline. I'm going to use the film up. <laughs> <laughs> there is no question. And I think, well, I'll thank you all. Fahad, thank you very much. Better Allah, thank you. And also, thanks to all the organizers, Muhammad, Jason, Hanan, and definitely for Professor Jazia. Can you ask a question? Yeah, <laughs> yeah sure. Okay, um, are there a difference in the product immunotherapy from company to another? Sorry, I know it's away from the discussion. Uh, uh, but there is a country published fake um, magic results. Ma I don't think we have head to head comparison between, we have to have a cross comparison between clinical trial like Pimpro, Nevo, or Atizo. Um, I don't think we know the difference, but for sure, atizo is better in terms of its CC. I so, don't know. So, so it's very difficult uh, to fake uh, randomized phase three studies, multi-center uh, international studies. So this uh, level of, of evidence that we follow uh, is, is, is almost impossible to fake uh, the results. So I, I would respect the, the evidence. Some smaller studies come from here and there, probably they don't change practice, uh, but uh, if you go with the phase three randomized study, uh, published uh, evidence, I think uh, you should be good. Uh, 
All right. Uh, so, Dr. Jazzy, I say thank you all. And if you, uh, if you finish the meeting, you will have the evaluation so you can have the CME hour. And inshallah, we'll see you soon in another meeting. Thank you. Thank you all. is Ian Chow. I'm a consultant medical oncologist from the Royal Marston Hospital, London and Surrey in the United Kingdom. Today I would like to discuss with you about patient reported outcomes of quality of life and its importance in gastric cancer treatment. Now patient reported quality of life is used widely in both clinical trials and also in daily routine clinical practice. It is actually a multi-dimensional assessment really look at, at uh, different functioning domains, the physical, cognitive, emotional, social and role functioning, but also a number of symptoms. And there is also a global health status where we assess our patients uh, or the patient reported their quality of life. So we've actually took it an opportunity um, to pull uh, data from two large randomized controlled trials in second line therapy of gastric cancer the REGARD and RAINBOW, which was assessing the use of remesuramab with or without Pachytaxel uh, in gastric cancer. Um, in these two studies, which have recruited more than a thousand patients, we were able to pull data on the vast majority of patients, with nearly a thousand patients. And what we were able to find out, first of all, in patients who have metastatic gastric cancer, the most important symptom which is reported by patient which is impaired the most were fatigue, pain, and appetite loss. The global health status has also been most impaired in terms of all the functional domains. What we also find out is that if patients have impairments of performance status, not only is it affecting their physical um, functioning, it also affects other um, dimensions of the quality of life. Uh, including the emotional, social, cognitive functioning, as well as multiple symptoms. In addition, uh, what we know is if a, a, a treatment is able to um, achieve disease stabilization or control, so i.e. if patient either had a response uh, to the treatment or at least have a disease stabilization, in the second line treatment of gastric cancer, the quality of life is actually maintained or improved compared to patients who unfortunately have disease progression. Although it might sound quite intuitive, but in fact, this type of data uh, have not really been looked at in gastric cancer uh, in the past. So really in conclusion, based on this uh, large data set, we're able to see the most important uh, baseline symptom for our metastatic gastric cancer patients impairment of performance status not only affect their physical functioning, it also affect multiple dimension of their quality of life. But if we're able to achieve disease stabilization or disease response, we're actually able to maintain patients' quality of life. So not only is this important in future um, uh, care of our patients in routine clinical practice, we also need to consider that in clinical trials of future uh, novel agents, uh, we don't need to just concentrate on um, achieving uh, responses because even disease stabilization in these patients would be a meaningful uh, to our patients in this setting. Thank you.